Morning, everyone. Happy Memorial Day. Milton here with today's devotional. Um, I'm using both ear sets right now because uh, as a lot of people walk by, they oftentimes talk and it actually affects me when I'm trying to concentrate and convey a message. Um, which conversely, uh, you know, as I pray for people and pray with people at church and things like that, um, I, there's something that I consider um, spiritual etiquette. So, you know, oftentimes there are certain types of people that pray uh, for others and they pray in tongues and they encourage them and are praying with them. But um, there are other times that uh, that more of a prophetic utterance comes forth. And when that happens, it makes more sense for the person who's receiving, who's getting prayed for, to be quiet and just to listen. Because oftentimes, when the prophetic word starts going forth, it actually answers the prayers that the person has been asking for, uh, has been asking God for, because God uses the prophetic utterance or the spirit of prophecy to edify, to comfort, to exhort, uh, the individual who's looking for that and so um right now I did something a little bit different uh, I'm actually in a little bit of a slant and uh, on a little bit of a hill here this is the Apollo Park where I usually walk at and um, and uh, and so this particular if you see right here on the side right 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 there um, there's a church there I don't know exactly what what type of denomination or any of that stuff. But every time I pass by and I'm walking by, because uh, it goes in, the, in a little bit of a round circular path, uh, every time I pass by this area, I'm just magnetically drawn to this particular church. Just, just looking at it, I'm just like, God, you know what? What is going on over there that I'm just so magnetically attracted to it? I tried getting a hold of the the pastor that that is there to you know just to to talk to him and to pray with him if that's what needs to happen. But unfortunately, he wasn't available, or I, I left a message and then they never got back to me. But um, you know, which I could completely understand. Uh, but. Um, but like I said, and this has been happening for like a month or so. I, every time I pass by this certain area here at the Apollo Park, I, I get eyes view. And this is a, a little bit zoomed in, so it's not this close. It's actually maybe a good two, three blocks away. And so it's a little bit zoomed in. Uh, and so through the magic of technology here, you guys are able to see it a little bit closer. And so every time I pass by this particular church, I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh my God, what is happening in there that I am just, I feel so incredibly drawn to go to pray for that church, to say something to that church, right? And so I'm, I'm letting you guys know this because then maybe you guys can help me in your prayer devotional time. Pray for this particular church. Like I said, I don't know the denomination or any of that stuff. And it's right now, it's not about that. Right now, it's about suffering. Right now, it's about people. Because as I look into that church uh, and from, an, uh, you know, pretty far away, it actually looks closer when I look at it through here. But, and I actually have driven by it before closer and I, I stepped a uh, foot in, on the property just before it says no trespassing. Uh, and I was actually um, thinking about doing the devotional there, but I was figuring, well, you know what? It might be considered against the law and I might get, get in trouble for that. So I better not, I better do it this way. And thankfully it worked out where, you know, uh, this thing, the, the phone was able to zoom in and still get me in the picture. Um, and so, like I said, I was just saying, uh, I was just so incredibly drawn to this particular church. Every time I pass by, my eyes are just magnetically drawn to it. And so I'm asking you all to pray for this church. Cause, because as I think about this church, as I look at this church, even now, I'm starting thinking about what happens in, in that particular church. But in that particular church, it resembles what happens in all of our churches, right? In all of our churches, it's not the church building that really matters at the end of the day. But it's actually what happens inside of the building. Because we are the body of Christ. We are God's church, the body of Christ. And so when we come together, whether it be in the physical building or outside of the building, that's when the things happen that need to happen. That's when healing happens. That's when restoration and redemption happen. That's when we who are struggling at certain areas and times in our lives, that's when we get the word that we need of encouragement, that lifting 
waking up that you're not alone word that we all need from time to time. Because oftentimes when we are walking around in this wilderness, it's a great example in the back, we're walking around this wilderness and we get tired and we get thirsty and we get lonely and we get scared in the, in the night because we don't know what's happening right around the bend. But then what happens in the house of God is what brings a total difference into everything that happens in our lives but oftentimes we just go for refuge sometimes we just go to get what we need and forget about what they need or what it needs because as we have something to give back uh, I think JFK at one point or another ended up saying you know ask not what uh, what your uh, country can do for you but ask what you can do for your country and the same is here. There is a gift inside of you that you can share and that you can encourage and that you can minister to somebody else. The Bible talks about it in many times in the, in the New Testament, in Ephesians, Colossians. It talks about minister the gift that God has given you. And then as you minister that gift, grace is empowering you and also meeting the needs of the people. So it happens this way. If I utilize my gift, whatever that gift may be, and then I minister that gift to somebody else, it actually responds and actually ministers to that person. And that person is edified. And I'm also strengthened because it, there's a word that is called charismata in the Greek that stands for grace, the gift of grace. And that word right there means charismata, which means little grace, like an endearing term. Like you would say, um, Milton, you would say, that's the proper name. And you would say Miltoncito in Spanish. It means little Milton, but it actually, mean, it actually means uh, an endearing form. This, I know you, you know, I, I know who you are. We have a relationship with you and therefore I can call you by a closer name. I'll give you another example. Uh, my friend Regal, many, many years ago, uh, I remember uh, it was a comical story. Uh, so, you know, I, I had barely come into church. It was like 1994, 1995, and, and I would be driving down to his house and we'd have Bible studies like every day, right? And so, uh, and so we're, we're talking and everything and he's telling me about God, teaching me about who he is and what he's about because I had all of these different types of concepts of who God was. And so I needed to be taught. And so I was very excited about it. And we'd always get together and just spend hours reading the word. I would come up with uh, different ideas and he would, uh, he would shoot them down or confirm them, right? And so, and, 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 uh, and so this one time, you know, he's telling me about his relationship with God and how he talks to, talks to God. You know, Jesus' name obviously is Jesus. In Spanish, there is, um, there's like a slang, but it's an endearing slang. And, and, and it's uh, for Jesus and it's chewy. And, uh, and, uh, and so, um, so one day, you know, we're talking and he's telling me about prayer and his relationship with God and, and he's telling me that God is not a formal type of God that you don't have to say, oh, heavenly father who walked in heaven and use all these these and the thou's and all these formalities to go and, and talk to God. That you can talk to him just like you're talking to a friend. And, and it was, it was, you know, revolutionary to me because I was barely coming into church and I was like, what? I can talk to God. I don't have to go through somebody else to intercede for me. I can talk to God for myself and he wants to talk to me. And so he said, yeah. And then he says, and then he says, you know, so he goes, sometimes I just go to, I just go to God. And I said, Joey, tu sabes, you know, <laughs> and then it was hilarious to me because it was so right on the money. It, it is a relationship. That is what he's looking for. God is looking for a relationship, not a formality and religiosity. I don't know if that's a real word or not, but I'll use it today. Not a formality and religiosity. He's looking for a relationship. He wants to commune with you. Jesus wants to talk to you so much more than you want to talk to him. When we go to prayer, we oftentimes are feeling afraid that, oh my God, if I pray, uh, is God really going to answer? And then sometimes we don't believe that he is and, it's, and it causes like a barrier the barrier right here. I don't know if you guys are seeing this fence right here, but it's the, 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 the fence of limitations that we put, not the limitations that God has put on us. He wants an open relationship. The reason why is when, when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says that the veil was torn in two. 
from top to bottom, giving us complete access to him. The, the access into the holies of holies, which is where the only place that the, um, that the highest priest, that the high priest was only able to go once a year. Once a year, mind you. Once a year is the place that he was able to go into once a year to atone for his own sins and for the sins of the people. We have access to that holy place every single day, every minute of every hour, every second of every minute. We have access to that because the Spirit tore the veil in two and given us full access into the holies of holies. God wants a relationship with you, with me. He wants us to be the sanctuary, the holy sanctuary that it, it was undefiled. That's what he wants us to be. But I digress. Like I said, as I was walking by, I keep seeing this, this particular church in there. It's not about the actual church or the, the denomination of what it believes or not believes. But it represents the churches all around the world. Because all of our churches at this point in time are going through different things. I don't know if you've noticed that, but there is a struggle. There's a resistance. There is this attack against God's anointed. And a, an attack and a resistance against the gospel of Jesus Christ being moved forward into the all the earth and so there is a spiritual thing that is happening and oftentimes and I don't know about statistics because I'm not a, a stats man but I know that there are churches that are closing down I'm not gonna say that that's what's happening to this particular church because I don't know but I do know what I feel I do know what I hear in the spirit when I pass by this house by th this particular house this particular church I feel the sense of that people inside of this particular church have been working and enduring the journey the wilderness for years of trying to sow and trying to reap what God has been doing in this particular area of Antelope Valley for years and now they are weary of the journey some of them are on the verge of giving up others are going through financial struggles others are feeling sickness in their body and they're dealing with all of these things that are happening day in and day out if we don't have fresh blood coming into the body of christ if we don't have fresh blood new converts they the what happens is the older people get older and then they die out and then what happens when they die out? The church dies out. That particular organism, that particular body dies out. Not the body of God, not the body of Christ as a whole, but it actually does this for the individual uh, sections or individual churches. So it is vitally important that the, the gospel be preached. It is vitally important that when new converts come in, because they are the fresh blood that we need, that oxygen that rejuvenates, that oxygen that gives life to the members. Diabetes is a horrible disease. I have it. Okay, I have it. So I can speak from it from that stance. If you don't take care of your blood sugar, what it does is your blood starts coagulating and it doesn't hold oxygen because the red blood cells hold oxygen. And so what happens over time, if you don't control your diabetes, if you don't control your, your blood sugar, your blood pressure, what it does is it causes a bad circulation to happen from your heart to your mind to the rest of your body. And so it starts attacking the members that are out in the outskirts, your fingertips, your toes, sometimes your eyes and this is why people end up going blind sometimes people get their fingers amputated their legs chopped off because now there's no circulation and what happened when there's no blood there is no oxygen going into that part of the organ of the body it dies for lack of oxygen it dies for the lack of the breath of god the oxygen of the holy ghost it dies because it has no cleansing blood to cleanse it and take away the the filth that is there because everything and I learned this back in high school uh, my uh, earth science teacher taught me every living thing produces waste I'll say that again every living thing produces waste and so whether that waste is you're going to the bathroom and you're removing the waste or if it's your blood you know getting recycled because it's bringing out basically your lungs breathe in air and they they, they the waste that it produces is carbon dioxide. However, carbon dioxide is what the trees need 
Uh, you can't see the trees. Sometimes. <laughs> I'm fortunate on this one. There are trees around me, and this is why it's a little shady. But the, uh, but conversely, the the carbon dioxide is what the trees' leaves need, and their their waste is oxygen that we breathe. Crazy, right? Cycle, the cycle of life. We are all interconnected. And so I, di I digress. I go back to this particular church. And so in this particular church, every time I pass by it, I say a little prayer for it as, as I walk by because this, this particular church, like I said, I can't prove it. I can only go off of what I'm feeling in the spirit. And I know that there are people in there struggling. There are people there who are hopeless. There are people inside of this particular church that resembles all of our churches. Once again, it resembles all of our churches. And so this particular church, your church, my church, your church, our churches, there are people in different stages of life. There are people all in, in different arenas there are in, in life. Some are going up, some are going down, some are having new births. Some people are dying in their families. Other people are going through struggles and, and sicknesses that are terminal diseases. And others are living on the highs right now of God's power and God's anointing and God's prosperity in their lives. Yet all of us combine, come together in one solitary place and we all need one thing and that's the word of life. That's the word that keeps us alive. Because all of these things, whether I think the, I think it was uh, David that says, uh, even at our best state, we are lighter than air. Even in our best state, we are all vanity. Vanity of vanities, as actually Solomon. <laughs> vanities of vanities, all is vanity. Even in our best state, that means when we are at a highest moment, when we are on top of the world, when we're getting the best paid job, when we're experiencing health in our body, when we're having revival in our churches, when we're having all of these great things happening, even at our best state, whatever that qualifies in your mind, even at our best state, we are lighter than air. We must consider those who are, may not be as fortunate as us. Some of those... People in there are struggling silently. Some of those people in there are being tormented in their minds at night. Some of those people in there are struggling just to make it through. And then we have oftentimes the audacity to start criticizing them. To say, hey, why are you late to church? What's wrong with you? How come you're missing this? How come you're missing that? And they are barely doing everything that they can to survive and make it another day and we have the audacity to look down off from our noses and say what's wrong with you you did this wrong you did that wrong you're not doing this just right when we should be reaching down lifting up instead of pointing our fingers and kicking down those who are already down so like i said this is your church this is my church this resembles your church, resembles my church, resembles our churches. It's not so important, the building, but it's who is inside. It's what happens inside. I'll say that again, what I said in the earlier. It's what happens inside that makes all of the difference. It's not the building in and of itself. Because if the Spirit of the Lord is not in operation in that building, you just have an empty building. You have an empty shell. But when the Spirit of the Lord comes, all things are possible. It's not by human might, nor by human prowess, but only by my spirit, saith the Lord. And that's how we are able to overcome all these things. And this is why it's so important that when we come together, we look for those who are struggling, those who are too weak to even go to the altar. Oftentimes, that's what I, this is what I do. I see those who are not going to the altar when the altar call is being given. And as I pray, I listen and I see and God shows me who to pray for. Because praying is not just about praying and just saying a bunch of words to somebody's ear or, to, or, or, or praying out loud and tapping somebody on, on the forehead. It's not about that. Prayer is about being effectual. And to be effectual, you have to have the right word to say for that person at the right time. That there's nothing more powerful than the right word at the right time. And 
when we are going through things, the Spirit of the Lord, if we are sensitive enough, the Spirit of the Lord will inspire us, will give us a discerning of spirits. It's the gift of discerning of spirits. And to know whether it's our voice, it's what we're judging according to what we see, because oftentimes you can tell those who are struggling and those who aren't, right? So it's not by my what I'm able to see. But it's based on what thus saith the Lord and what he tells me. Oftentimes, he has me praying for people that I don't even know who they are. First of, first of all, I don't know who they are. The first time visitors, uh, I hope I don't scare them away. Um, and uh, I don't know who they are. I don't know what they're going through. All I know is that I've come in tune to the voice of God. Right? I've been doing this by the grace of God for many years. And you get to a place where you're able to hear the voice of God and understand what he's saying. And regardless of what the, the circumstances may look like, regardless of whether the person looks like they're, they're mean-faced and they're, they're hard-hearted, because you can tell uh, uh, people when they, when they look like that and when they look like they're not receptive. Sometimes that's a front. Because we all are afraid and we all put a front. We put up walls around us because we don't want to be hurt. Sometimes we get church hurt. Sometimes we just are hurt in life. And because of that hurt, we want to protect our feelings. We want to protect our hearts. We don't want to go through that pain again, understandably. But sometimes that happens is when I hurt my hand and I work too much with my hand, it begins to build calluses. A callus is the body's natural response to pain and hurt and an injury. And what it does is it produces more skin and it covers that particular area, a callus, and until the injured part becomes healed. The, the, the dangerous part of that is that when we become callous in the spirit, we are no longer able to be sensitive to the Spirit. It takes Him longer to get a hold of us, to touch our hearts, and to speak to us because we have calluses, we have wounds, we have hurts that we're trying to protect. And these things are the things that are affecting us and that also affect others. Because sometimes other people who are in the church are going through a lot worse things than you and I are going through. As I'm not trying to minimize what you're going through. We all are going through something. But oftentimes, those who cannot even make it to the altar are the ones who are in the most desperate need. The ones can't, that can't even lift up their hands, that cannot even lift up their eyes. The ones that are bound by guilt and shame. The ones that are bound by the, the, the regret in their lives. That they don't even have the, the ability to even look up, to even lift up their hands. So they're just holding on to the church pew. They're just sitting there with their eyes to the ground because they feel condemned. They feel rejected. They feel hurt. They feel abused and they feel like no one's going to understand where they are and, and what they're going through. And that's what the trick of the devil is, to try to divide and conquer. So he separates us from everyone else. So then the blood doesn't flow to us and cleanse us. The Bible says that if we abide in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us. There's that cleansing word again. It cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And so once again, I say, even if you are struggling, I encourage you to go make it another day. Go to church. Make it there. Reach out to somebody. If nobody is reaching out to you, that's another thing that happens. Sometimes the people at church that are going through something themselves are expected to reach out to other people who are maybe in a worse situation. But unless the church itself is healed then how can they be effective at ministering, at healing, at nurturing, at restoring, at redeeming others who are lost as well? So like I said, as I pass by this particular church, it's just like I said, it's just a, a, uh, what it resembles or what it represents. It's not about this particular church in and of itself, but it represents your church, my church, our churches, all the churches all around the world. Right now, there's a spiritual attack that is happening because most of us don't realize in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall dream dreams and your old men shall see visions. And upon my handmaidens and on my servants, I will pour out of my spirit upon those days, right? 
and we all get excited and we, yeah. But the last days in, I think it's First Timothy, it says perilous times are coming. So now the news flash is perilous times aren't coming. Perilous times are here. The beautiful part of that is that in the midst of the perilous times that you and I are going through in this world, God is doing a miraculous work. He's doing his greatest work in the midst of the perilous times where brothers are going against brothers and sisters and people are betraying one another, hating one another. The Bible says that we are to endure until the end. He that endureth until the end, the same shall be saved. So we must endure. Endure what? Being hated of all men for my name's sake. So, like I said, in the midst of the perilous times, that perilous actually is translated as treacherous times. Treacherous times are here. And a lot of people are being treated treacherously. Betraying one another. Hating one another. Hurting one another. Abusing one another. Or others are lording over others. Taking what they have and telling your fellow servants, you are supposed to serve me. That's what happens in Matthew 24, which God calls the wicked servant. He says, oh, the wicked servant said, oh, my Lord delays and is coming. I've heard that Jesus is coming for years before, uh, you know, my grandparents, my great grandparents, my parents, everybody was telling me Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming and he hasn't come yet. So I decided that I'm going to get mine. So I'm going to take yours. And you start abusing your fellow servants and making them serve you. And so you're just fulfilling scripture. In Timothy, it says, for in the end times, scoffers will come. Saying, oh, we've heard that he was going to come back, that Jesus is coming, but he hasn't come yet. So we fulfill scripture or you fulfill scripture by being a scoffer saying, nah, I've heard it so many years. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. He hasn't come back yet. You're actually fulfilling scripture. <laughs> so you're a part of the end times. Congratulations. And so, um, so once I say, uh, like again, I say this right here represents your church, my church, our churches. Let us pray not for the church building itself, but let us pray for the people that make up the building. We are living stones made from the living God. For he is the living rock. And out of that living rock comes the living water. And that is what who we are. And we are builder. We are builded one of another. We need one another. I cannot do this on my own. You cannot do this on your own. We need each other. And the, what happens when you and I reach out to each other and we say, hey, I need your help. I, I'm struggling right now. Being Just being transparent and being honest and just saying, listen, can you pray with me? Can you pray for me? Whether, you, whether it's um, an unspoken prayer request or something that I'm actually going through because there are certain times when you're going to need to confess it. When you're going through something and you pray about it, a temptation, a sin, that it slowly becomes a stronghold over time because you're not able to kick it. You're not able to get delivered of it. You're not able, you confess it. You're doing everything you can. You, everything you know how to do, you praise, you worship, you pray, you read the Bible, you, you know, you go to the church functions, you do everything that you know how to do, but yet you're still struggling with this particular thing. You just can't seem to get rid of it, kick it. You just, you're, you're struggling with it. At that point, when you're struggling that hard, you need to call on somebody else and be accountable. Because when you start confessing that to some an elder, you reach out to your elders and you start confessing that and you say, listen, elder, I'm struggling with this. Whether it's pornography, whether it's, you know, overeating, overindulging, whatever it is. I'll tell you this much. When you start overindulging in your flesh, Meaning oftentimes it's, it's, uh, it's seen in overeating. 
You're looking for the pleasure. You're looking for the ice cream. You're constantly looking for the pleasure, the pleasurable things, the dainties and the delicacies of life. Ah, you know, I want to go eat this, this uh, great cake. Oh, I heard about this thing and I'll drive millions of miles to go to this restaurant to go stuff my face because I'm a connoisseur. <laughs> and so you're constantly feeding your flesh. I noticed in my spiritual walk over almost 30 years that people who overindulge in their flesh are oftentimes bound in the spirit because you cannot, how are you saying you're denying yourself if you are never saying no to yourself? Denying yourself means I say no to me. Jesus said, this is what is actually needed before you even pick up your cross and follow him. You have to say no to yourself first. And so that means I, when I want to do something, I have to say no to me. Yes, that sounds like a great idea. I would love to get some ice cream, a whole bucket full, and just stuff my face, especially when I don't have to work, work and I don't have to do anything. I'm just going to sit here and binge and watch Netflix and just scoop, scoop after scoop after scoop. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, sure. And you're, 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 uh, you're taking that pleasurable thing, you you know, you consider yourself saying, oh, well, you know, I deserve this because I work so hard Monday through Friday and even on the weekends. I do this and I do that. And we start giving uh, rationalizations and excuses to why it's okay for me to stuff my face, for me to indulge myself, for me to grat self-gratify in whatever area that may mean to you. And so, but how can we be disciples if we're not disciplined, a disciplined person, and, and, and I've been thinking about that because a disciplined person, I'm going to actually move this a little bit because I don't want it to get too hot and, uh, and then turn off uh, of itself. So I apologize about that. Um, so if we are disciples, we are called to be disciples and we are supposed to be disciplined, right? How are we supposed to be disciplined? The answer, I think, is found in 1 Corinthians, I think it's 2 9, where Paul talks about it. And it says that we are supposed to run this race like, a, uh, like an athlete, the race of faith, like an athlete who's training. I don't want to just get on the path and start running just to be running. I, if I'm going to run the race, I'm going to run so I could win. And so what happens? I'm going to discipline. There's that word again. I'm going to discipline my body. The Bible calls it buffet my body. I'm going to put it under subjection. I'm going to tell it and take dominion over myself and say, no, I know this is what you want to do. This is your craving. This is what you desire. But this is not what you're going to do because I'm going to command you today. So I'm going to train you. You're going to get up early in the morning, even though you worked all night. It doesn't matter because we are in training. In strict training, I'm going to have a specific type of meals that I'm going to eat. I'm not going to just eat anything. I'm going to eat the things that probably taste a little bitter, the things that are more organic, I drink a lot of water, and those things of that nature because I'm in training. I'm in strict training is what the Amplified calls it, being in strict training. Because I have a goal in mind and that goal is to make it until the end and not just finish the race. But if I'm going to finish, if I'm going to run this race, I want to be the first one over that finish line. Because then we have a crown of life that we are going to have awarded us. And in James, it talks about that same crown of life, the crown of victory, the wreath of victory is the Bible says that Jesus says, or it says that blessed is the man that endureth temptation for when he is approved, when he is tempted and passes the test, meaning you don't give in to your temptation. You're going to stand and say no to your temptation. Then it says, then God gives them a crown of victory to all those who love him. Did you guys get that? To all those who love him, when we win the race, when we get the crown, it means that we were proved and tested. And so temptations are not there to not necessarily just bombard you and beat you up and cause you to sin. Although that's what happens sometimes. But the temptations come to test and to test what? To test your faith. Another word for testing is tempering. Like in, like in a forging of a sword, you temper it's hot, it's fiery, and 
there's a lot of beating that happens with that hammer. And so the things that we go through in this life, the temptation, and oftentimes I find that the temptation is not so much lust for those who are more mature in Christ Jesus. The temptation is oftentimes is to get angry. Because we have been exercised in good and evil. We have been doing this for a long time and we see what's happening and we see beyond what is actually being said and what is actually being done. The Bible talks about it in Proverbs where it becomes, uh, basically in lack of a better word, it calls it crafty, but not crafty in a, in a deceptive way, but understanding what is happening and you're seeing beyond the words, reading between the lines as they say. So those of us who are more mature are able to see what's actually being done and said behind closed doors oftentimes. And so, we get angry. But the Bible says, doest thou well to be angry? If thou be angry, don't you know that sin lieth at the door? The word lieth there is interesting. Uh, and I'll put all this, uh, hopefully the scriptures <laughs> in, in, in the comments later on. But the word lieth there, L-Y-E-T-H, I believe it is, or L-I-E-T-H, lieth at the door. It's uh, oftentimes, everybody probably has heard this before, it's like a, uh, like a lion crouched down in the savannah behind the bushes where you can't even see it. There's a lion there crouched. And as soon as you get close, it's going to jump and pounce on you and devour you. That's what the word lieth mean. It also means, it also means if you secretly indulge in hating your brother, Sin lieth at the door. If you don't do well, sin lieth at the door. If you indulge in secret hatred against your brother or your sister, then sin, you're beckoning sin. You're saying, come here, kitty, kitty. Come here, kitty, kitty. Because you don't believe. There are a lot of different types of people that go to our churches, all of our churches. Not everybody's perfect, not everybody's saved. Even among those who have been, you know, repented of their sins, baptized in the name of Jesus, and been filled with the, the, with the Holy Ghost, with the initial evidence of speaking in other tongues. But the difference is this, that's only the beginning. What we need to do is focus on being fruitful. What type of fruit are we supposed to be bearing? Because Jesus said, even right now, the ax is laid at the root of the tree. Every tree that does not bear forth fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And so it's very serious and we need to be prepared and we need to do what we need to do on our side to prepare and, and be a partner with God to bear fruit. And how, what fruit is he looking for? The fruit of the spirit, his spirit. Love, peace, joy, temperance, meekness, faith, and a bunch of other ones, joy, <laughs> and a bunch of other ones that I don't remember right now. But that is the fruit that he's looking for because that is the fruit of his nature. And so the difference between those who are, repent of their sins one day, are baptized in the name of Jesus, and are filled with the, in, with the Holy Ghost, with the initial evidence of speaking in other tongues, the difference between those who spoke in tongues once and those who bear the fruit of God's spirit, of God's nature, of his character, are the ones that spend time with him. Those are the ones who got full or got filled and stay filled. Those are the only ones who bear fruit, the fruit of his spirit. It's not about works, although good works will follow. But the main thing we need to focus on is to focus on cultivating our relationship with God. That stony heart, that hard ground. The Bible talks about things in Hosea where it says, sow unto yourself righteousness and you will inherit mercy. Plow up the foul ground, that hardened ground. Plow and start taking stabs at that hard heart of yours that you may sow in righteousness and may bear fruit of mercy and you will receive mercy. And so that's what we need to do because 
there's a lot of stuff that's happening in our hearts and things are happening in our minds that only God knows and only we know. And so those are the very things that we're supposed to be confessing to God in our prayer time. And like I said, when we don't have the wherewithal to be able to do it on our own, that's when we call a brother. That's when we call a sister. That's when we go to church right up there. You see that right there? Like I said, it just represents what the church is, not that particular church in, in and of itself. But it represents your church. It represents my church. It represents our church in the whole world. And yes, those people in there may not be perfect. Those people in there, you would even consider hypocritical. Those people in there have flaws, failures, faults. They don't do things right all the time. Just like you, just like me. We are all flawed. We are all undone. We are all sinners saved by grace. So let us give that grace to others. Don't go in there with the chip on your shoulder expecting, here, come serve me always. But God wants to use you to minister to somebody else. And yes, you who are struggling, because oftentimes when I fall down and I learn, okay, I see how I got here. That gives me the keys that I may share with somebody else because that may be the key that they need to unlock the door of their own prison. Oftentimes I find that we are standing in prisons, invisible prison bars, behind invisible prison bars, free. But we've been conditioned to think that we have to do something extra outside of belief, outside of trust, outside of accepting God's forgiveness, accepting God's love, accepting God's freedom. We think that we have to go and earn it. We have to do penance. We have to do this, that, and the other. We self-exile. We torment ourselves and say, you know what? I messed up yesterday, so God's not going to use me when I go to church. So I'm going to go and sit this one out. And there are certain times when you need to do that because that's just being uh, honest before God. If you ain't right, you shouldn't be ministering. <laughs> you know, that's just plain and simple. If you're harboring hatred in your heart against your brother, you shouldn't be ministering to people. If you can't love your wife as Christ loved the church, you should not be ministering to people. And likewise with women, if you cannot respect and obey your husband, you should not be ministering to people. I said that part. Now, going back to this part. So when you mess up, we have a promise. It says, because God is faithful and just. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. There's that word cleansing again, of all unrighteousness. When we confess our sins, we have to confess our sins. And like I said, going backwards, if we confess our sins and then we keep on doing the same thing over and over again, don't give up, don't give up. Call for reinforcements. That's, like I said before, that's when you call an elder and you say, hey, listen, elder, I prayed about this. I fasted about this. I worshiped and praised and tried to praise my way through this thing. And I still keep falling in the middle of the night, falling prey to the same thing. Help me pray with me. Pray with me that God would deliver me, that God would heal me because sin is basically wounding you, your soul, your conscience, that you don't have any confidence with God any longer. That's the seriousness of all of this. When, when God came looking for Adam and Eve after they sinned, they hid. And he said, Adam, where are you? He says, I'm hiding. He says, why? Because I was afraid that you because I was naked. I was ashamed. I was naked. He said, who told you you were naked? God already knew he was naked the whole time. But Adam didn't know he was naked. It wasn't until he sinned and ate of the forbidden fruit that his eyes were open and he said, oh my God, I'm naked. And he was ashamed. So, ashamed, so, so shame will try to separate you from God. 
God already knows every single flaw, every single mistake, every single sin, every filthy thing you have ever done and will ever do. And yet he called you. He's not afraid of your filth. We can be completely honest, completely transparent with him. With man, maybe not so much because sometimes men and women are not able to see past that which we confess. But with God, you can be completely honest, rawly honest, just completely raw and honest before him and say, God, I'm struggling with this. I've been doing this thing. I've been doing that thing. I've been saying these things. I've been watching this. I've been hearing this. Help me. I've been meditating in my mind and in my heart over this thing that I've been wanting to do. Those are the very things that we're supposed to confess. I apologize for taking a long time <laughs> on all of this. I really thought it was just going to be a very simple, you know, hey guys, help me pray for this particular church, which is your church, my church, our church is what it represents. Because there are people in there who are struggling just like you. There are people in there who are sick just like you. There are people in there who are desiring to be healed and be encouraged and to be uplifted and to have their needs met in a specific surgical light, laser light surgical way. And that's what the prophetic word does. A prophetic word goes specifically to the target and answers and deals with the things that are in the heart of man. And so that's the value of that. Um, and so, like I said, once again, I, I thank you for your time. When you have a moment, please, I don't know what the financial situation is in this particular church, but that's what I find and I feel in my, in my spirit. Finances, sickness, and weariness. The three things that are plaguing that church. I can't prove it, but this is what I'm picking up in the spirit. And those are the three things that are affecting your church, my church, our churches. Financial stress, sickness in my body, and weariness of the journey. Because when we get weary and we get tired, then we start complaining. That's what happened to the children of Israel. And uh, in Psalms, I think it's 105 and 106, uh, they start recounting that. And it's very serious because complaining people are lustful people. They're never satisfied with what they have. They always want more, more, more. And so what they have isn't good enough anymore. I want greater, I want bigger, I want more. The Bible talks about it and says, Con be content with the things that you have. Contentment and godliness is great gain. In other words, just being happy for because you're saved, that's the basis, the foundation of our joy. Once again, just being content with godliness, being content because I'm saved today. I woke up this morning, I didn't have to wake up. I woke up this morning in my right mind. I could have been a reprobate and would have been lost already. Backslidden, falling into temptations, but by the grace of God, I woke up this morning with Jesus on my mind, wanting the desire to praise him, to serve him, and to minister to his people today. It didn't have to happen that way. It didn't have to happen that way for you. So we have something to celebrate. We celebrate the risen king. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, I can face whatever comes my way. Because he gives me the peace that passes all understanding. I can bear the load of the situation, of the circumstances. I Yes, I may be weary, but I won't give up. Because when I look to Jesus and I see what he suffered, I see him on the cross then I see that I am able. I didn't suffer as much as he did. I wasn't beaten because of my sin or for somebody else's sin. I wasn't used and abused for that. I wasn't nailed to the cross. I wasn't, I didn't have to endure all of these hurtful things for my salvation. He did. And so when I compare what he suffered 
to what I'm going through, it makes my suffering a lot smaller. It puts it in perspective. And say, so, you know what? Because we have the tendency of making mountains out of molehills. We have a tendency of spiraling out of control and making huge things out of nothing. But when we start comparing what we're going through, you but you don't understand, Milt, what what they said to me, what they said about me, how they hurt me, how they abused me, how they mistreated me. I may not understand, but Jesus understands. I may have been, I may have unjustly uh, endured that and gone through that. But I have faults and I have failures. And if I'm not being punished for something, maybe I'm just not, maybe I'm being punished or I got caught speeding one time and I want to go and fight it at the, at the, at the, at the court. Say, oh, you know what? Well, you know, there's a loophole because uh, the, the, the policeman didn't show up and all this other good stuff. We come up with some creative ways to shift the blame. When in reality, how many times have we gotten away with speeding? How many times have we gotten away with not stopping fully at a stop sign and then doing the California roll, as they say? How many times have we passed by and gotten away with murder, let's say, but this one time that we get caught and now all of a sudden, you know, now we're going to go and fight everything because there's a little loophole. Love is not looking for loopholes. Love is honest and true. Love is not looking for reasons to disqualify you or to reject you or to treat you, um, to tolerate you. It's not looking for reasons to just say, well, you know what, I'll let them come, and but uh, that I have no relationship with that person. Love is not doing that. Love is looking for ways to try to embrace and try to bring close, to be inclusive, not to be exclusive. Because exclusive is basically elitism. And we don't serve an elitist type God. He loves the greatest of all, as much as he loves the least of all. He loves the oldest as the same as he loves the youngest. He loves the greatest tither as the one who only gives a dime. His love is not conditional like man's love is conditional. He wants to embrace all of us and be inclusive of us. He wants us to be partakers of his divine nature by his promises. That's how we are. That's how we get there. We get there by his divine promises. Then we start because we believe in these promises. The Bible says that every man that believeth cleanses himself from his filthiness because he wants to be holy. He wants to be right, upright, and pure. He motivates us not with standards and not with laws and not with beating us over the head for our faults and our mistakes, but he motivates us to do good by being good to us. The Bible says that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. That's what he's using. He's going to be so good to you in the midst of your worst failures. In the time that you're messing up the most, he's going to be so good to you that it basically disarms us from every excuse, every reason, everything that we think we have a right to fight against God and others so god is so good to us that it disarms us and then he leads us to a place of repentance why because in an essence repentance is a call to reconciliation oftentimes i think i find that people use repentance repent which is a five letter word they use it like a four letter word and they start to try to browbeat others into submission by saying, you're wicked, you're wrong, you're bad, you're evil, repent. These things may be true. But repentance at an essence, at its essence, it's God's call to reconciliation. God wants you to repent because he wants you to turn around from where you're going so he can embrace you again. Even if you repented of your sins one day, were baptized in the name of Jesus and were infilled with the Holy Ghost at one time. It's a daily thing. Repentance is a daily thing. 
Why? Because he wants to commune with me and you every single day. And during the night, the Bible talks about it. It says, after uh, uh, the man sowed in his field and they were sleeping, an enemy came and planted tares, the seeds of tares, while they slept. Certain things happen in our sleep that we're not even aware of. And we wake up and we wonder, why are we waking up in a bad mood? Why am I waking up with this weird feeling? Why am I waking up, you know, strange? It's because what the devil is planting in the subconscious at night. So we must be able to pull those things up by being honest. Why do I feel the way I feel? Why do I think the way I think? Why do I see the things the way that I see them? Is this the way that Jesus sees them? Is this the way that... Can his eyes see through my eyes? Can his ears hear through my ears? Can his feet walk where I'm planning to walk? Can his hands touch and do the things that I'm doing and touching? Would he be pleased with that? That's ultimately what we're trying to strive for, is to please the Lord. That is a higher relationship. That type of thinking, that type of mind frame is what elevates you from being a son and a daughter and it takes you to being a bride. Because just because you repented of your sins and been baptized in the name of Jesus and you got filled with the Holy Ghost once, doesn't automatically put you in the bride of Christ, contrary to popular belief. We must prepare ourselves. Revelation says that the saints, they prepared themselves for the bridegroom. The bride prepares herself like a chaste virgin. virgin. She's looking, wiping off every spot, every wrinkle. It needs to be perfect. It needs to be right. It needs to be white. It needs to be right. Because I want to please my bridegroom. That's what separates us between being a son and a daughter and a higher relationship to being a bride, the bride of Christ. I was told by my pastor a long time ago, a previous pastor that I had, uh, and he taught me, says, the difference between the sonship relationship and the bride relationship is that you spank your sons and your daughters to get them to do right. You don't spank your wife or your bride to get her to do right. She'll do right because she wants to please you. Not because she's afraid of being punished or the consequences. And that's where the heart condition comes in. The greater, the higher relationship in God is having that bride and bridegroom relationship. And that is attainable to all of us. We just have to have the want to. We can stay in the outer courts and being sons and daughters relationship. Or we can go into the holies of holies and have that one-on-one -on -one intimate relationship before the Ark of the Covenant. Where God says that there will I speak to you face to face as a man speaks unto his friend that relationship that is what he's looking for a bride and a bridegroom relationship because he loves the bride of Christ he wants us to be a part of it but we cannot be a part of it if we are full of pride so we need to pluck up all of these things lust of the eye the lust of the flesh the pride of life those things are worldliness that are creeping in our hearts and our minds, but nobody sees them. And those are the very things that we're supposed to pluck up before God in prayer. So I think with that, I leave you today. <laughs> Thank you again for bearing with me. I know it's a little long. I, I, uh, I, I, I promise you every time I come, I'm thinking it's only going to be five minutes and then an hour later. So I apologize about that. Um, Thank you for bearing with me. And like I said, Pray for the body of Christ. Pray for the church. Not the church building. Because the church building is its not about the church building. It's what happens inside within the members of the building. That's where the healing. That's when the redemption. That's where ministry is really happening. It's within. And it could be outside of the four walls. It doesn't have to be in the walls. It could be over Facebook. It could be as you're walking down the street. It could be as you're going through the park, like I've done it before. You start talking to somebody, and then all of a sudden, 
you feel the unction of the Holy Ghost and you say, hey, can I pray with you about this? And you go into a prayer, prayer, a little prayer session right then and there. That is what God is looking for. Available, able ministers. He already made us able ministers of the, of the new covenant, but are we available to minister? He's with us. He's inside of us. He's for us. He's not against us. And he's going to see us all the way through. Believe that. And until next time, God bless you guys.